Well, I'm excited about this series that we're in, The Names of God. Tonight, we're going to be talking about Jehovah Saba. Jehovah Saba, the Lord, our mighty warrior. And I'm so glad that I got this one. This is a good, this is a man one, right? This is good. I like this. Um, so we're in this series, and, and we're seeing how descriptive the Hebrew language is compared to the English language. The English language is very limited when we start trying to describe the characteristics and the attributes of God. And all of us are wanting to know God in a more deeper way. Well, that's our pursuit every day. That's my prayer every day. God, I want to know you more. I want to know you more deeply. I want to know you more intimately. That's what I pray about in my prayer time. And, and um, the more that we understand God, the more that we are able to walk in victory and power, and anointing, and joy. And I don't know about you, but I like all four of those. I want them all, all the time. I think that's very important for all of us. And oftentimes, I think God speaks to us more in our pain and our difficulty than in any other time in our life. And the awesome thing about God is God has a name to meet us at every single obstacle and every single trial that we face in life. Now, We've been talking about a couple of different root words. One is Elohim, Elohim, which means mighty, strong, creative, all-powerful, Elohim. The second word that we've talked about is Jehovah, Jehovah. Jehovah means always has been, always will be, no beginning, no end. In other words, a permanent existence, that's Jehovah. We see the word El before the name El Shaddai. We see the name Jehovah before the name Jehovah Saba. So we see the word Jehovah, we see the word Elohim, and we see how these names of God are so important as they connect with God's character and God's nature. So as we study these different names, They help us discover new things about God. One scripture I want to share with you is Proverbs 18, verse 10. It says, the name of the Lord is a strong fortress. Excuse me. The godly run to him and are safe. Psalms 111, verse 9. He has paid a full ransom for his people. He has guaranteed his covenant with them forever What a holy, awe-inspiring name he has. So if you've missed our previous sessions, I want to encourage you to go back uh, on our podcast and listen to the sessions that our lead pastor, Pastor Tim, has covered. You can also pull it up in our church app either way, but I want to encourage you to listen to those. Um, Go ahead and go to 1 Samuel chapter 17, and this is going to be where we're working out of tonight. I think I would be remiss not to talk about the battle that the children of Israel had with Goliath. I mean, you have to talk about that if you're going to be talking about God, the mighty warrior, right? I mean, you just can't skip that story, and it's one of the best stories, I think, in the entire Bible. I mean, I've read it over and over and over again, and I never get tired of reading it because it's just so awe-inspiring. So 1 Samuel chapter 17 And we're going to start around verse 4. It says, The Philistines now mustered their army for battle and camped between Soko and Judah and Hezekiah. Saul countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the valley of Elah. So the Philistines and the Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with the valley between them. So there's this epic battle. (laughs) You know, it's, it's set up. I mean, if you, if you can visually see things like you see a movie, you know, this is a really cool thing. If you watch like Lord of the Rings, you know, you can kind of get that visual, right? Or King Arthur, you know, this, this big fight. So it says, Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Goth, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was nine feet tall. Gulp. <laughs> Now, I've never met anybody that tall. And I pray to God I never do meet anybody that tall. That's, that's a big person. 
So he comes out, he's nine feet tall, he wore a bronze helmet, a bronze coat of mail that weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor. He carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and as thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying his shield. How'd you like to be that armor bearer? That was a job. So Goliath stood and he shouted and he made these taunts across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight? He called. I'm the Philistine champion. I can just see him, you know. I'm the Philistine champion, but you're just servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we'll be your slaves, but if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send a man who will fight me. And when Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Now, throughout history, this has been done. Two representatives are picked to come out by way of representation and so they will represent opposing sides. This has been done time and time again. Neither force wants to expose itself to the risk and the high cost of casualties. So they'll send one man out that represents this army. One man comes out to represent this army. Whoever wins the battle, the victory goes to the entire army. Whoever loses the battle, then they become servants of that entire army. So let's see the spiritual application here. Let's just look at this. <clears throat> Adam was our first representative, and he lost. He lost. I mean, he lost to the devil. He lost dominion to the devil. He lost his authority to the devil. So the enemy has bound mankind in sin, in addiction, in hopelessness, in darkness, for thousands of years. But then the second Adam, Jesus, our second representative, Jesus came and Jesus won. Can I have an amen? amen? See, Jesus won the victory. This second representative, he was a victor over our enemy. And now the whole world is able to be reconciled to God. That's why you're in this room tonight. You've been reconciled to God because of what Jesus our mighty warrior accomplished for us. So by being on Jesus' side, you're on the victor side. You're not on the loser side, you're on the victor side. And I don't ever like being on the losing side. That's never fun. I try to smile and, and act nice about it, but on the inside, I'm not really all that happy. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Goliath was more than just a large man, though. He was more than just this tall guy. The scripture reveals that Goliath's origins were outside of human influence. They were, they were supernatural. As a matter of fact, Genesis chapter 6 tells us about a mixed breed of people that were results of fallen angels that bore children with earthly women, resulting in what we call the Nephilim, or demigods. And these were superhuman beings. They were superhuman people, and they grew way taller than your average person. They were way stronger than the average person. Now, most of them were annihilated in the flood in Noah's day. Most all of them were killed off in that flood. Because remember, <clears throat> when God was talking to Noah, he said, I've looked over the whole earth, and the whole earth is wicked. Everyone is evil. Everything is bad. So Satan's goal was to contaminate the bloodline because he knew that the Messiah would have to come through people, have to come through people because Adam sinned. And because Adam sinned, Adam owed the debt of sin. And so God could not pay that debt because God wasn't the one that sinned. Man sinned. Man owed the debt. But the problem is, man couldn't pay the debt because man owed the debt. So only God could pay the debt. So now we've got a problem. Man can't pay it alone. God can't pay it alone. So God said, I'll send my son 
Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, that'll be a name that we look at, God with us, I'll send him, he's all God, and he's all man, and he's sinless, and he'll pay the price. So what the enemy said was, I'm going to try to stop this from happening. So I'm going to try to contaminate the bloodline of the human race. And that way I can prevent the Messiah from coming and paying the price that Adam incurred for all of us. Are you seeing this? But the only problem is God stopped it. God said, I'm done in the flood. We know that God wiped out his creation. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11, it's very interesting because, like I said, most were annihilated in the flood, but seeds of giants are still found in Scripture after the flood. And in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11, it talks about Og, king of Bashan. He was the last of the Rephates. Now, listen to this. His bed was decorated with iron and was more than nine cubits long and four cubits wide, and it is still in Rabbah of the Ammonites. So we're reading about the size of a bed for a person that is 13 feet long and six feet wide. That's a big bed. How'd you like to build that one? It's a big guy. So Goliath came from a dying breed of giants. His armor alone weighed way more than David did. Just his armor weighed way more than David did as a, as a person. <clears throat> we know in Numbers chapter 13, Moses sent spies to spy out the land, the promised land. And in verse 32, it says, all the people that we saw there were giants. Giants. These are terrifying people. Now, this is not a fairy tale because you can uh, just Google it if you want to. There's been a, quite a few archaeological digs where they've dug up the bones of giants, the skulls of giants. You can actually see that these people are way bigger than your average person. So this is not a fairy tale. You, you, you can see this in history. So in verse 8 and 9, a challenge was issued to come out and fight. And we've all been right here, church, in our own personal lives. We, we all have daily problems that we face. We all have daily struggles and obstacles that we have to deal with and try to figure out. But, but there's certain times in life, though, that you're faced with a giant. It's just bigger than you. It's just way bigger than you. You can't figure it out. You can't fix it. You can't really counsel it. There's not really a whole lot you can do about it because it's just so enormous. It's just terrifyingly enormous in your life. And the Israelite army was not afraid of the enemy army until the giant stepped out. See, when Goliath set his foot on the battlefield, everything changed. Verse 11 of 1 Samuel, it says, When Saul and the Israelite army heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. It's very clear that the Israelite army is overpowered because they don't have a giant that they could send out that could oppose Goliath. They just had regular men. But the Philistines had a giant named Goliath. Now, you know you're facing down a giant battle when the size of your opponent is way bigger than you. You know that you're facing down a giant when your heart is stricken with terror and fear. It shakes you on the inside. We've, most everybody in this room, if you've lived for very long at all, you've been there. You've faced something, you know, with a family member or a child or something with your health or something to do with your job, some, something you, you, you've come up against, maybe job loss or a marriage struggle. I, I don't know what it may be, maybe dealing with your teen or, or somebody at work. It's just, it's a giant for you. I mean, it's just a big, big deal. 
And your giant, it influences your thoughts. Your giant influences your sleep. Your giant influences your appetite. Your giant in influences everything about your life because it's a giant. And that's what giants do. Giants affect you in a way that the average problem in your life does not affect you. You know, oh, well, y'all y'all pray with me about this. Okay, I'll pray with you about that. It's just, you know, it's not that big of a deal. But, but the giants are different. They're different. You, you, you don't even feel like, you almost don't even feel like if you went to a group of your friends to pray for you that it would do any good because it's a giant. It's a big thing in your life. And this giant, it taunts you daily. You can't get any relief. It's day after day. This is what Goliath did. This went on for 40 days, day after day, coming out, coming out, taunting, defying, taunting, defying. They were dealing with this. Verse 16 says, day after day, he taunted them. It's with you when you go to bed. It's with you when you rise up. We've all experienced this. We've all encountered a giant of a problem in our life. And then David shows up on the scene. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to start with verse 12. Now David was the son of a man named Jesse, an Ephrite from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. Jesse was an old man at that time. He had eight sons. Jesse's three oldest sons, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shimei, had already joined Saul's army to fight the Philistines. David was the youngest son. David's three oldest brothers stayed with Saul's army, but David went back and forth so that he could help his father with the sheep in Bethlehem. So he's not really like an active soldier, right? He's not full-time enlisted. He's just kind of a courier, right? He's just helping out because he's younger. Nobody really gives him a lot of attention. They're not really paying a lot of detail to David. So for 40 days, every morning and evening, the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israelite army. And one day Jesse said to David, take this basket of roasted grain and these loaves of bread, carry them to your brothers. And he gave these 10 cuts of cheese to their captain. See how your brothers are getting along. Bring back a report on how they're doing. So David's brothers were with Saul and the Israelite army in the Valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. So David left the sheep with another shepherd. He set out early the next morning with gifts and Jesse had directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts of battle cries. Soon the Israelite and Philistine forces stood facing each other, army against army. David left his things with the keeper of the supplies, hurried out to the ranks to where his brothers were. And as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Goth, came out of the Philistine ranks. And then David heard him shout his usual taunt, to the armies of Israel. Now, as soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Have you seen the giant? The men asked. He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king's offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He will give that man one of his daughters for a wife, and the man's entire family will be exempt from paying taxes. Now, that is a pretty big motivator, but it's a giant. I mean, I don't care if you give me a brand new SUV. I'm not going out there. You know what I'm saying? Forget it. David asked the soldier standing nearby, what will the man get for killing the Philistine and ending the defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? Now, I want you to look at David. I want you to take a minute and examine his response. I want you to listen to his words. I want you to see his attitude. I want you to pay attention to his stance, how he's standing. Right here, we see David has a knowledge of God, and he knows God in a way that none of the other people of God do. And there's, those are all God's people out on the battlefield. All of these warriors, they're all men of Israel. They're all God's chosen people. And right here, church, is why we are in this series 
on the names of God. This is why we're doing this. The army of Israel is made up of people who belong to God. They are in covenant with God. Church is full of people who belong to God. We are in covenant with God through the precious blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. But when a giant steps into the arena of your life, you find out real fast who knows Jehovah Saba, our mighty warrior, and who doesn't. See, it's, it's the deal breaker. It's the game changer. You know, we go to church and life is good and, and, and church, don't get me wrong, I don't want anybody to have to go through difficult times. But you're going to. You are going to. The Bible says, when storms come, not if. It's, it's when, not if. They're going to happen. And sometimes they're going to be a hurricane force in your life. They're going to be really, really big. Now, I'm not speaking anything over anybody. I'm just letting you know the nature of life and how life works. None of these men asked for a giant to step out on the battlefield that day. None of them were expecting Goliath to step out on the battlefield that day. It caught them all by surprise. And the fact of the matter is, most of the time, that's what happens to us. We're living life, life's going pretty good, and all of a sudden, a giant. Where in the world did that come from? Life was going good. I felt like I was making progress. I felt like I was moving forward. And then I got this doctor's report, or then we had this setback, or then my child got sick, and we can't figure out what's going on, or my family's going through some struggle. My business has been foreclosed on. My best friend, you know, stabbed me in the back and, and, and really hurt me. And we all face these moments in our life. But I want you to notice that David recognized that this giant had no connection with God. None. He had no supernatural anointing. He had no supernatural connection with God. But David did. And you do. See, your giant in your life does not have that kind of connection. But we have that kind of connection because we're in covenant with Almighty God. Goliath is not on the side of Jehovah Saba, our mighty warrior. He's on the enemy's side. He's on the losing side. We're on the victor's side. See, David knew that. He knew it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? In his mind, in his heart, he knew he was on the victor's side. While all the people were fascinated and overwhelmed with the size of Goliath, David was fascinated and, and overwhelmed with the size of God. It just overwhelmed him. He didn't see Goliath out on the battlefield. He saw God in front of him. He saw Jehovah Saba, his mighty warrior, out in front of him. Look at verse 32. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. No, that's just a young guy. All these mighty warriors are standing around. There are just thousands of them all around. Don't worry about this Philistine. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. Now, now listen to me. Saul is your mind. Saul is your mind. <clears throat> it's an unruly leader that has to be brought under the control of the Holy Spirit. And we see Saul as this representation of this carnal person seeing things with a carnal perspective. So he looks at David and he judges a book by its cover, which was a huge mistake. All he saw was a small boy because he's not seeing through the eyes of faith. He's just looking through natural eyes, which is a mistake when you're facing a giant. Because you've got to see by faith. And so Saul says, don't be ridiculous. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're just a boy. He's been in war since he was his youth. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. And when a lion or a bear comes to steal the lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club. Wow. 
That's impressive. I rescue the lamb from its mouth. And if the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. Ghoul. Pretty tough 15-year-old. I've done this to both lions and bears, and I will do it to this pagan Philistine too because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear. Look at these past victories that David's looking at. These are stepping stones of faith that David is elevating himself. God did it for me here. God did it for me here. It's no different. God will do it for me right here. See, we can't forget what God has done. We can't forget victories that God has delivered us out of. We have to remind ourselves of those altar moments in our life so that we can continue to move forward. And that's what David did. Saul finally consented, all right, go ahead. <laughs> May God be with you. You know, you can just kind of see that. That's kind of funny, right? May God be with you. <laughs> Saul gave David his own armor. Bronze helmet, coat of mail. David put it on, strapped a sword over it, took a step or two. I mean, couldn't even barely walk. I've never worn anything like this. I can't go out there in these. He protested, I'm not used to them. So David took them off. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream. He put them into his shepherd bag and then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Now, when I think about that staff, I think about Moses with his staff. Now, remember Moses' staff, that staff represents authority. It represents God. So David's got this staff. That's why, that she why a shepherd always carries a staff. That's, that's authority. That's God. And so he's going out here to meet Goliath, not just with his slingshot and his ability, but he's got his staff in his hand. He's going out there with God with him. Now watch this, verse 41. Goliath walked out toward David with a shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And, and David's thinking, this is no stick. <laughs> and he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here, I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals, Goliath yelled. Are you, are you guys ready? Y'all ready? Watch this. David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you are taunting. You're not taunting me. You're talking smack to Big Daddy. The HHH, y'all know who the HHH is? That's the head honcho of heaven. It don't get no higher than that. Goliath is talking smack. Now, Goliath thought he was big, but he just didn't realize that God is way bigger. God poured the galaxies from his hand. I'm talking millions of galaxies from his hand. God's way, I mean, if if you were to try to get a comparison, I mean, it would be like, Goliath would be like a booger on the end of God's finger. God would just flick him. Just, woo! That, I mean, that's literally the comparison. Some moms are in here like, don't talk about boogers. Don't do that. <laughs> you come to me in your own strength, but I come to you in the name of Jehovah Saba, the Lord, my mighty warrior. And he says, the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you, and I will cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. They will know. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with a sword and not with a spear. This is the Lord's battle. See, when you face a giant, it's not your battle. Come on, church, it's the Lord's battle in your life. You got to let God fight your battles. That song we sing, this is how I fight, come on, this is how I fight my battles. And so David understood this. He knew who God is. David knew Goliath was not walking under that supernatural covering that he was walking under. You clearly need to know that God loves you. It's important. We clearly need to know that God provides 
for us. We clearly need to know that God is peace in every storm that we face. But when a giant steps into your life, you need to know Jehovah Saba, the Lord, my mighty warrior. As I close tonight, before I end this session together, before we get up and walk out, before you end the the podcast that you're listening to, you know, everybody in here listening, I believe, is probably a follower of Jesus Christ. You've given your life to him. You've been saved. You know God loves you. You know God's paid the penalty for your sins. You know you're going to live eternity with him. But you may be facing a giant in your life right now. Now, Everybody in here is in a different place, and I certainly don't want to assume that, you know, you came here tonight and, and life is just going great for you. And if it is, hey, praise God, praise God, praise God it is. That's an awesome thing. But some of you are here tonight, and, and there's a giant in your life, and he's, he taunts you daily. It may be insecurity. It may be fear. It may be worry. It may be a health problem. It may be a relationship issue, but the giant won't go away. And, and I, I just want to take a moment right now where you are. Let's just take a moment to connect with Jesus tonight. Let's allow Jesus to come in and be our mighty warrior, Jehovah Saba, the Lord, our warrior. I want to remind you tonight that Jehovah Saba is bigger than your problem. Jehovah Saba wants you to hand your worry over to him. Whatever it is in your life tonight that maybe as you came into this building, maybe this week that you've been dealing with and you've just been struggling with it and you've been carrying it, I want to encourage you tonight You're not meant to carry that burden. David couldn't carry that burden. He had to let God fight his battle. And you got to go into the battle of your life seeing and being connected with Jehovah Saba. It's time to stop worrying and start praying. It's time to start believing. It's time to start trusting God. It's time for you to hand that worry over to him. God, we breathe in the peace that passes all understanding, a peace that defies reason, a peace that you give us in the midst of facing some of the biggest giants in our life, but we have this this sense of peace. It's supernatural. It passes understanding. It protects our hearts, God, because we're in that place with you, in that anointed place with you that you protect us. Church, this is how you fight your battles. This is how you face your enemy. You face your enemy with the knowledge that Jehovah Saba is by your side. And that Jehovah Saba is the one that can stop the giant from taunting you in your life. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I just loose the anointing of freedom over your people. God, I loose the power of your Holy Spirit in their life. And God, I take authority in the name of Jehovah Saba over the devil, over over taunting demons in the lives of your people, God. And I declare freedom tonight in the name of Jesus. God, your word promises us that you give your godly ones a peaceful night's sleep Satan, you won't continue to disturb and taunt God's people as they rest at night, but they will have a good rest, a peaceful rest, a renewing rest. And Lord, just like your word says in Hebrews, there is a rest for the people of God. There's a rest. There's a place that we can come where we're confident and we're safe. Doesn't mean that we're not going to face storms. Doesn't mean that we're not going to face troubles and difficulties, but what it does mean is that we have a confidence of knowing that whatever giant that we face in life, Jehovah Saba is with us. He is the Lord, our mighty warrior. So God, tonight we praise you and we thank you and we honor you. Those listening by podcast, 
May God touch you in a special way. And may the power of God become a reality in your life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.